Hello, good morning, good morning, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in for yet another tech drop in. I'm just going to give a few seconds for the attendees to roll in and uh, stabilize. But thank you for making time this morning uh, or afternoon, where, wherever you are. Uh, we now have about 35 attendees. Okay, it's going beyond 40 now. I'll probably give another 30 seconds for people to come in. Hmm. Sound check, are you uh, all able to hear me all right? Yes, we can. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, let's get started. We now have a stable list of attendees. Thank you all again for joining in for yet another technical uh, session, a tech drop-in hosted by Veritas. Uh, today we have on the panelist, and Chexan, if you could move to the next slide. Today on the panelists and the presenters, we have Chexan, uh, who is our technology practice lead based out of Singapore. Chexan is uh, our expert in uh, disaster recovery, data protection, as well as uh, our net backup uh, appliances. So Chexan, thank you for joining in today. He joins us from Singapore. Uh, we also have Sasipong and Ronnie, who are solutions architects uh, based out of Thailand and Singapore, who are going to help us today with our question and answers. And I'm your host, uh, as well as I'm going to present a few um, slides here today. Uh, I'm Amit, based out of Melbourne. So as we go along, uh, Sasipong and Ronnie are going to help us with the questions. And please utilize our Q&A um, Q uh, panel here to put in questions. Now, the incentive for asking questions, of course, is a $25 Amazon gift voucher. We are uh, looking at the best question. So feel free to ask any question pertaining to the topic today, or if you have any questions pertaining to data protection or data management in general, feel free to type in your question here in our Q&A panel. And uh, you know, Sasipong and Ronnie will try to answer it right away. If in case we are not able to get to your question, uh, please be assured that we will reach out to you separately after the session with an answer. So the best one today will get a $25 Amazon gift voucher and uh, we will get uh, in touch with you on the, you know, who's the best after the session. So with that said, I'm gonna kick off uh, with, you know, a, a little more um, insight on a recent survey that Veritas has uh, run. Now we, we did um, a, a research focusing on Kubernetes and this search was run in 11, countries and it's an independent uh, research run by Op Opinionum. And they were run, run in 11 countries, about 11,000 decision makers. And the objective was to get a look and feel and view of how Kubernetes is being adopted in the organization and how is the, uh, uh, you know, the, the strategy in terms of managing Kubernetes environments coming along. So as we went through, as we went through, there were quite some insightful um, findings that came out of the survey. You know, so if we move on to the next slide, Chexan, thank you. Uh, we saw that, uh, you know, 87% of the organizations will have Kubernetes deployed in their mission critical or production revenue generating applications or environments in the next three years. Now, if you see, you know, what stands out of this you know, first observation is today the number is 34%, right? So it's not a very significant number to look at production mission critical applications that are running in containers of Kubernetes per se. But, you know, that number is obviously going to go into 87% in three years time. Now, if, if you're not, you know, if you're not surprised, I'm I'm also looking at the non-mission critical and de development environments. They are going to grow at the same rate, you know, so it's quite, quite a, um, you know, intriguing fact that production mission critical and development, all of these environments are going to move at the same rate, which is quite, quite a good, you know, predicament that Kubernetes platform is quite stable and people have started to trust it. As we moved on, we also looked at, you know, the, the exposure or the risk of running Kubernetes and having the exposure for being attacked by ransomware. So, um, Chexan, if we move to the next slide, we saw that you know 41% of the environments have already seen attacks 
on ransomware attacks or it could be spyware uh, malware coming in on the containerized environment now as much as we started to trust uh, our kubernetes and container platforms we are also seeing that these environments are not spared either i mean if you look at the public clouds and if you look at the virtual machines you are still in the 40s and uh, 40% to see having being attacked and now containers obviously is not something that has been spared in the recent times so it's again something that we all need to be cognizant that as we start transitioning from virtualized environments or infrastructure as a saas to containers we are not closing the gap on uh, the risk vector or the exposure we need to have that additional effort taken to ensure that our container environment is safe as well so as we move further i'm going to you know get a poll here and you know trudy is going to help us with a poll and this poll is just ensuring that we have a baseline in terms of the next few uh sections that we are going to delve into so the poll question is you know what are the benefits of having a standardized solution for data protection and ransomware resiliency now when i say standardized you know we have seen transition from physical machines to virtual machines and virtual machines to public cloud and um, now containers as well the definition of standardized here is you know why not have one single data protection strategy across all of these different types of workloads now the options are here uh, obviously uh, you know compliance and uh, you know simplified operations cost of optimization exactly cost optimization becomes because if you had a single solution we have an optimized cost or all of the above now we just want to baseline this probably you're going to give another 2 or 3 seconds before we can close the poll uh, and that should be it today can we close the poll now all right i'm going to look at the result there we go so this is not surprising right 92% responses imply that you know we have compliance simplified operation and cost cost optimization as the three things that define a standardized solution okay so as we move on so this is this is good insightful and i'm going to keep talking in the same direction that you know now that we have acknowledged the vectors that the vectors are going to remain the same it is important that we standardize our data protection solution on containers as well and hence you know as as you see the benefit of having a single solution that goes across um, your physical environment virtual environment public cloud containers as well as paas makes it simple you know to restore you know so no new knowledge to be acquired because it's the same solution and the same platform to do do that we also have the single pane of glass to manage so as you see you know from our survey as well 99% respondents valued the fact that having a single solution standardized solution helps now to this number today was 92 which is not too far away so we are quite happy that we are in line to the survey as we move along you know the other interesting finding that came through our to that survey is if you see 49% of the organizations are uh, you know are expecting to spend uh you know 49% on data protection in the environment for uh, in in due course of time of 5 years right and 61% of the organizations aim to be fully protected and well prepared on their kubernetes environment in the next 5 years so 49% organizations are expect expecting to spend a lot more money on um data protection for kubernetes and 61% believe that in 5 years they should be in a good state where um you know they are fully protected on kubernetes environment so it's it's again an interesting observation and i'm going to now summarize all these numbers in few statements right so one is of course no surprises there kubernetes is being widely adopted in mission critical environments secondly much of that technology is being left vulnerable so if you see the previous uh, number right 67% were uh, or 61% were aiming to be fully protected in 5 years but it's quite a long time to keep the environments open and vulnerable for the next 5 years so that's where you know we wanted to take this opportunity and talk to you about what are the vectors that can hit kubernetes environment 
how can we mitigate and how can Veritas help, right? And fundamentally, what we are trying to aim for is to bring in that awareness, bring in that, um, you know, that view of what we are hearing from our customers worldwide, and then make you in a better position or bring you in a better position to take a decision on how you want to protect your Kubernetes environment. So that's that's the objective. And I'm just trying to lay the land uh, for the session today. So today, what we are now going to do is I'm going to hand it over to Chexan. Chexan is now going to walk us through what Veritas can offer in terms of ransomware resiliency and data protection for Kubernetes. Um, over to you, Chexan. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Chek San. I'm part of the technology practice lead team within Veritas, and I cover the data protection portfolio in Veritas, which includes net backup, appliances, and whatever that comprises of data protections. So uh, before we move in to talk about Kubernetes protection, I want to touch on the bigger problems that the industry is facing now, which is on uh, ransomware threats. So how do we um, position ourselves and protect ourselves against any of those ransom, ransom attacks, ransomware attacks? So let's start off with talking about some of the whys on the importance of cyber resiliency. So firstly, we'll be on challenge number one, which is increasing IT complexity, where data is all over the place, not only geographically, but also spread across multiple providers, whether in the cloud, in a hybrid cloud or in the on-premise. Um, and it, it also resides, our data also resides in multiple form factors, whether physical, virtual, cloud containers, Kubernetes, whatever. Data is important. That's the bloodline of any organizations. And to add on to the, 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 the problem, there's also exponential data growth. And of course, as we all know, there's no sign of stopping this data growth. As this continues, the threat actors has uh, growing options or growing number of options which they can attack. So 94% of senior IT executives say that their security measures has not kept up with the complexity and rightfully so because of the growing risk and growing amount of data and complexity of the IT infrastructure, it becomes more challenging for them. Now, talking about challenges. The next two challenges I'll interlink and sum up together. Firstly, is on ransomware um, as a service vendors, where now it becomes like a service offering for different, um, I would say, different actors or different uh, um, um, uh, those uh, attackers. And they exist in large numbers. They have successfully transited from a high, uh, from, to a high profit business model of um, creating havoc and cri crippling organizations at their most vulnerable times to maximize their ransoms. This uh, uh, ransomware as a service business provides turnkey codes and uh, have advanced support networks to help with helplines, provide tools for encryptions, communicating with victims and helping on the ransomware or ransom collections. They are sharing information, so it becomes a bigger risk for organizations worldwide. And it's a common practice for bad actors to get into systems, they dormant. And the goal is to learn their systems, the infrastructure inside out, find all the dark corners, so and, and the most vulnerable places within the infrastructure. And uh, this ransomware uh, may remain undetected for a long period of times. And sometimes they are referred to as the dormant ransomware sleeper ransomware or cyber reconnaissance, and it becomes a very common occurrence nowadays. An another area of growing uh, concerns will be on cryptocurrencies, which is helping organizations uh, or these uh, this, uh, ransomware attackers to find an easy way of collecting uh, the ransom. And it becomes easy and untraceable for them to be, to be paid. Now, the next few areas, I'm going to group them together again. So, uh, for example, the vulnerable I, uh, um, industries are huge targets. Because attackers are going all the way out uh, to find the most vulnerable targets to ensure that they are able to collect ransoms. So, for example, like supply chain attacks are up 300% in, in last year. Uh, tech Target uh, reported that the supply chain attacks are the number one trends in 2022 this year. 
and new technologies are opening up the doors, uh, different options for them. There's an increased number of adoptions for new cloud uh, adoptions, uh, sacrificing the best practices and good security hygiene, for example, like Kubernetes, which means that bad actors know that there's period adoptions and adjustments, uh, which make them an easy target. We have already seen a vast influx of zero-day attacks in this year. For example, the log 4 j the, uh, the major CVEs, are now being exploited by these ransomware groups. Security measures are not keeping up to date because of certain, um, I would say, worldwide, uh, area, uh, worldwide uh, events, for example, like work from home or the pandemic uh, transitions. So <clears throat> based on the vulnerability gap research done by Veritas, so um, organizations are not, uh, are not keeping up with the security measures, even though they say that they have done uh, 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 um, similar, um, I would say, uh, measures uh, one year ago uh, with 64% with, um, uh, say that they are going to the right directions. But now with the current uh, change of dynamics, only 39% of the senior IT executives are saying that uh, the measures are not keeping up to date. And lastly, there's an urgent need, uh, a change of mind, mindset shift that attacks are penetrating and security alone is not good enough for organizations to protect themselves from these ransomware attacks. They must think of strategy beyond just data protection, basic backup and recovery, and add multiple layers of security and protection tactics. It's not no longer a if, but when things will happen. Now, how do we position ourselves for, the, uh, for organizations uh, to protect uh, against ransomware. Uh, let's talk about Veritas strategy. Firstly, <clears throat> is to be able to protect, safeguard the data integrity with system hardening as storage immutabilities. Second, is to be able to detect, be able to monitor and report on system activities to mitigate risk and vulnerabilities. And lastly, is to be able to recover, providing an automated and orchestrated way of complete cross-system recovery and non-disruptive rehearsal. So let's go into more details about this strategy in a, a couple of steps that helps to go towards this goal of ransomware resiliency. Now, we, in Veritas, we provide, I would say, six recommended steps or ways to be able to um, protect against this ransomware uh, <clears throat> So this will align with the industrial best practices and highlight the strongest differentiator by, uh, by performing these six steps right away um, to keep your business resilient. Now, let's go into these six steps in more details. First step, uh, eliminate with data visibilities. So attackers are always going around looking, looking for the weakest link in the IT infrastructure. Those dark places or dark infrastructures that you may or may not have seen uh, provide limited uh, security or oversight by the IT administrators. That's why it's vital to have implement tools to provide full visibility or awareness of all your data, providing a, a light to those dark areas or dark data in your environments. So according to Veritas uh, um, vulnerability lack research, 35% of data in the data centers are still dark, which means that IT may not know where the data is or what these data are for. This number is alarmingly high because knowing where the data is and uh, what they are supposed to do is critical to have complete visibilities across the entire infrastructures. So Veritas provides tools, for example, data insights and IT, uh, uh, IT analytics to be able to scan the infrastructure, the different workloads and applications to provide you an overview and analysis, and of course, the report on the complete visibilities of your infrastructure, be it on-prem as well as in the cloud. So we strongly recommend for you to discover where your data is and what they are supposed to do uh, to find this, data, uh, this dark data. Now, step number two, protect all the data from all sources. Once you know where your data is, make sure that all the parts of the IT infrastructure from physical, virtual to the cloud, and of course containers, are backed up using a universal protection strategy that's applied intelligently and managed automatically 
to scale properly. Now, after sneaking into your environments, cyber criminal, criminals often search for confidential information and locking credentials to allow them to move laterally and across the entire infrastructure. Now, it's important to secure your network, to encrypt your data, um, uh, both in transit as well as at rest, adopt a zero trust security posture across the entire infrastructure, limit what and where each set of credentials can operate and have different passwords for every domain, adopt a role-based access control as well as multi-factor authentications. And of course, talk about protections or data protections, uh, implement uh, immutability storage so that, so that you can ensure that data will not be able to be changed or uh, deleted. And this one is important enough that we are going to have our own steps, the third steps to implement a data uh, um, uh, immutable storage. Now, the third steps is to provide a, a, a layer of uh, immutable and indelible storage. So what do you mean by immutable? Immutable means the data that is residing on storage cannot be changed. Indelible means the storage itself is not deletable. So users or uh, uh, bad actors are not able to uh, go to the, the like BIOS or the firmware and then make any changes, delete the entire set of data that is residing on the storage. So a strong strategy is to safeguard the data from tampering to implement implement, uh, immutable and indelible storage to ensure the data cannot be changed, encrypted, deleted uh, for a determined duration of time. So in Veritas, we, uh, uh, we offer immutable storage your way or your options. So nobody can claim uh, the, the breadth and depth that we are able to provide to, for immutable options and flexibilities. We also uh, provide um, um, a zero trust strategy, for example, zero trust communications, where we um, have a, a trusted way of, um, of communicating, where only the right amount of um, permissions and rights are being given. We also have a zero trust uh, pro uh, um, processes where it only limits the, uh, uh, the right uh, people or right accounts for the right roles or right uh, uh, execution uh, for, the, for the codes. And zero trust privilege so that only the right amount of permissions are given to the right users. So with that, we are able to uh, uh, secure the entire parameters as uh, for, from a net backup perspective, as well as uh, lock down the storage layer um, where we add in the layer of uh, immutable and indelible storage within the Veritas appliances. We also provide uh, com uh, compliance clocks and immutable uh, options uh, within the uh, storage that is managed by the Flex appliances. Now, if you want a BYO or build your own options, it's also possible which is fully integrated with net backup. And <clears throat> like many of our competitors, um, uh, that where they need to follow a certain set of protocols or, 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 or hardware. So if you want immutably for your primary data copies in the cloud, you have that uh, within, uh, within net backup. Uh, and, it, and we can also have a, a single point of control of uh, when and where a life cycle policies for all your data within your on-premise as well as your cloud environments uh, and stored, to be stored in an immutable storage in the cloud. Now, <clears throat> we can also offer uh, air gap um, uh, environments for, for, for you. Uh, for example, if you look at this chart, on the left-hand side is your, is your production environments where you have your primary workloads, those data that is supposed to be backed up and backed up to a net backup uh, infrastructure. Now, you can also set up uh, optionally uh, uh, isolated recovery environments, IRE for short, where it's a trusted and secure environment and so-called independent of the primary uh, domain or primary environments. And we can, we can um, uh, have what, a, a one-way communications where it pulls the data whenever the policies within the IRE environment comes in and it's a unidirection communications where only the data or only the servers within the IRE environments can communicate and pull information from the production environments to have a secondary copies in the IRE infrastructure. So this infrastructure on the right-hand side will be in a way 
secure and trusted so that you can know that this data that is being uh, replicated to the IIE environments are uh, immutable, are protected and secure. And optionally, we can also replicate the data to another offsite location, for example, in a cloud environments to perform different options or flexibilities of recovering the data or entire sites into that these, uh, the, the DR sites or in the cloud environments. So we have complete flexibilities on how uh, the, you can design your air gap environments by having this isolated recovery environments and then extending out to another infrastructure in place for recovery. Now, the fourth steps talk about detections and alerting mechanisms. So we have uh, anomaly detections. So we can provide tools that, uh, um, that gives the AI-driven detections of anomaly behaviors or activities on both the data as well as the users. So putting concrete and automated measures in place to alert if anything happens that's out of the ordinary in your infrastructure. This strategy will give you an upper hand so that you do, can take actions before bad actors have opportunity to attack. So uh, um, products like uh, Veritas Data Insights can provide an anonymous triggers on things like unusual file write activities that can in in indicate an infiltration as well as using it to detect known malware file extensions, file access patterns, traffic patterns, code downloads, access uh, requests, and storage capacity search, exter ex uh, external traffic patterns, as well as unusual jumps in activities compared to individual uh, typical patterns. This is vital to be in, uh, all these activities are vital to be notified immediately, so out, which is out of the ordinary. So on top of that, net backup IT analytics can be used to provide anomaly detections for net backup and analytics reportings on third-party backup uh, products as well. Uh, so this will help to eliminate infrastructure blind spots by providing clarities and visibilities whenever needed. Now, anomaly detections will be good, but you'll be better if there's a malware scanning to ensure that the backup copies are free from any known malware or viruses. Now, NetBackup is able to provide that, but more on that in the ne next step. Since I mentioned a lot of, on anomaly uh, detections, so how do we do that in, in NetBackup? So understanding what is anomaly detections. So a good way to understand how it's been done is to envi envision a polygram or in a layman term is lie detector. Uh, so when you take a polygram test, the examiner will begin by pre-screening uh, by asking a series of questions to establish a parameters of what constitutes a normal environment or normal behavior. So when you lie, the uh, physical, physiology indications of blood pressure, the pulse, the, uh, the skin conductivities will fluctuate and expectedly outside of the normal parameters that you typically uh, uh, have. <clears throat> Similarly, NetBackup leverage an AI-powered detection engine to calculate the parameters of what constitutes a normal and uh, 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 base parameters based on the metadata patterns over time. For example, this is a set of um, backup jobs that's done over a series of um, uh, uh, past backup jobs or uh, tasks. So events that occurs outside of the established normal are being captured. So anything that is within here are considered uh, within the two lines, the two red lines are considered normal. So anything that jumps beyond that red line is considered abnormal and it will be captured and notified in almost real time. So anomalies are also observed when <laughs> they behave, uh, provide a score based on their severities. So how much jump uh, beyond the normalcy or normal uh, 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 range will pro provide you a scoring behavior. And the, the further the distance from the normalcy, the severe, more severe the score is. So this will help to help the backup and security identify which insights are actionable, which are providing or reducing the false positive of these this, uh, abnormalities. So overall, 
the AI power anomaly detection engine in NetBackup helps to mine an uh, enormous amount of data, uh, automate the monitoring and reporting, uh, helps uh, organizations to gain actionable insights, reports on criteria, and more importantly, establish an early warning of any attacks. Now, uh, on top of that, we can provide malware detection as well by providing some kind of scanning mechanism uh, on top of the anomaly detections. We can, which this can provide a proactive alert uh, um, uh, mechanism to the admin for out, any out of norm situations on the client backups. So now we focus on the malware scanning, which can be done in an automated manner or uh, by, sorry, automated manner by, by the anomaly detection um, uh, scoring mechanism. So just now I mentioned about the scoring, the further the, the distance away from the normalcy, the higher the score. So we, based on the scoring, we can trigger an automated scanning of the backup copies uh, by having uh, uh, a so-called um, inbuilt kind of uh, malware scanning uh, of those backup copies um, uh, in place. We can also do a on, a on demand malware scanning. So we can do it during uh, um, so during a backup uh, of the of the of the uh, of the clients, it, we can do anomaly detections at almost real time. So after the backup, we can do a spot check of known high risk areas. What are those common non high risk areas? Those holes that are in the DMZ zone or those facing the internet, all those are high risk. And we can do a so called uh, on demand scanning of those holes. Um, they are uh, being backed up uh, um, uh, within their backup and we can provide a scanning mechanism for those. And we can also provide um, a, a due diligence kind of, of practice where before any of the restore of uh, a task being performed, we can do a, a, a pre-recovery job to scan those backups uh, so that we can ensure that those backups are clean from any of those malwares that are residing dormant within the backup copies. So at least you have an assurance that these are this data uh, uh, that's to be recovered are free from any of the malwares or uh, ransomware viruses. Now, the fifth step is to provide an um, uh, optimized or optimized way of rapid and hybrid recovery at scale. So it can, this, this uh, step provides you a very quick way of getting uh, any of those systems that are down or any of those files that are down uh, uh, to quickly go back to running that applications uh, and even at a large scale. So optimize, uh, truly optimized for recovery experience requires a very careful planning and orchestration. So um, with this, we can provide a, um, a very quick way of uh, being able to recover not only on a very granular level, but also on a scale out level where we can provide a, a, a data center level kind of recovery. And more importantly, also op give you options of recovering to the cloud environments. So we have a way to be able to extend the, the infrastructure of your backup infrastructure and then replicate the data to the cloud environments and be able to recover in the cloud. So these options give you an orchestration mechanism to recover the entire data centers in one click to a target cloud providers, for example, AWS. So uh, you can be uh, away from your original uh, uh, production environments, which you might feel that, oh, maybe it has been uh, compromised by any of the ransomware uh, uh, viruses. So this is important because it gives you uh, options of recovering to an alternative or disaster recovery site. <clears throat> now, this will be a very, uh, uh, I would say, big deal because it gives you flexibilities of where you want to recover, uh, whether uh, where, whether it's uh, within your original production environments or to an alternate site uh, uh, where uh, the data are or the backup data are residing. Now, the fifth 
or sorry, the sixth or the last step is to provide a non-disruptive recovery rehearsal where <clears throat> uh, typically cyber criminals hope that the organizations are not optimized for recovery because they want to for you to, to pay them so that they can uh, um, release the, the, uh, the codes for, to un encrypt or decrypt your, your, your data. So <clears throat> they want the maximum damage and downtime to ensure the payments of the ransom. So if, if you are ready and rehearsed for recovery, so you are ready a big step ahead. So to get into a rapid recovery, you must have a response plan for your entire infrastructure, which includes testing and testing early and often. So regular rehearsal for your recovery will help to li limit the downtime and disruptions and help to reduce the impact of any attacks. So Veritas make it easy and efficient to execute non-disruptive tests with rehearsal that is automated and ensure that it's leveraging on non-production uh, re uh, resources such as network uh, fencing, sandbox environments. So <clears throat> we can put a plan together, okay? conduct non-disruptive rehearsal and rehearse early, rehearse often. So uh, according to our research, 57% of organizations hasn't really tested their DR plans in the last two months. Now, this may not seem like a long period of time, but with the speed and velocity of data growth these days, I would somehow disagree. So what often what occurs in two months um, uh, is, is 10 million plus ransomware attacks because uh, based on reports, every, every second, there are about 19, 19 uh, uh, attacks being been tested on for around the world. So the reason many of uh, those organizations don't test is because testing can be incredibly disruptive to, to production and operations. But with Veritas, <clears throat> we can have the uh, rehearsal mechanism uh, using the same orchestration platform. We can do uh, the, the non-disruptive rehearsal testings uh, within your infrastructure or across to a different uh, cloud locations. Now, with this, <clears throat> the six steps, and they have been tested to work. Uh, Veritas has 100% recovery success rate for our customers. Now, with this uh, understanding of the six steps recommendations, let's do a second poll. So, um, pretty now, second poll. So, which of these top <clears throat> six steps do you feel are the most important to address in your infrastructure. So, so please select only three. So we have eliminate with data visibilities, knowing where your data is, what your data, and, uh, and how these data are being used. So the data visibilities. The second step, protect all the data uh, from all sources. That means be having a copy or multiple copies of data in different locations. And then storing this, the third step is to store this backup data into, onto immutable uh, uh, and indelible storage and provide an air gap solutions for those data uh, uh, backups copies. Now the, with, the, uh, with four steps and uh, having a, a detection mechanism and malware scanning is important because you know that, okay, uh, are there any abnormality activities happening in your infrastructure, uh, especially as, uh, as uh, uh, you don't want your backup copies to include those, those, those uh, malware as well. So malware scanning of the backup copies will be important uh, um, uh, to, to be able to identify whether any of those uh, uh, data or those malware or ransomware has been backed up. The fifth step, having a, um, a tool that helps you perform rapid hybrid recovery and perform at a scale that you require because sometimes you need to plan for the entire data centers to recover to a different site. So having that sixth, fifth step will be important. And the last one is to have a rehearsal. Always practice what your disaster recovery plan and, and strategy is important. So these are the six steps. So which are the three things or three steps that you feel that is most important in your organizations? So, okay, I think we have given it enough time so we can close the poll and provide the results. 
So the top three I would say from here would be protect all your data because yeah, data is important. So you need to protect all the data from all sources. Second one is to have anomalous uh, activity detections and malware scanning. So that's important because you don't know, sometimes uh, unknown viruses or uh, unknown malwares are, are residing in your infrastructure. So you need a, a mechanism to be able to detect those, those files or those malwares within your backups, ensuring that the backup copies are clean. And the third one I would say is a mix of having in indelible uh, immutable storage as well as a, a, a mechanism to be able to recover at scale into different locations and be able to, re, uh, to, be able to, to uh, uh, rehearse, provide some kind of rehearsal for those data, uh, uh, those, uh, those uh, uh, recoveries. So these are the top three, I would say, and I definitely agree with you. These are the three steps or three areas that a lot of organizations are looking at. Now, now that we have given our recommendations of what we can help, how, how we can help organizations on ransomware protections, let's go into the next area on Kubernetes. So you have understand how NetBackup is able to protect uh, uh, or help organizations protect against ransomware. <clears throat> now let's go into slightly more deep dive into Kubernetes protections. So some of the challenges that Kubernetes have. So <clears throat> when we talk to our customers and as well as technology partners, we know, uh, we understand some of the challenges on protecting Kubernetes infrastructure. And we want to share with, with you what we have learned and so that we can help to, to avoid some of these issues or challenges. Um, <clears throat> so first one will be under integrated. So what do you mean by under integrated? So typically the solutions or nowadays the current data protection uh, offerings that we have are typically not so cloud friendly or not uh, being able to integrate into Kubernetes natively. So it's not tied in with the Kubernetes construct. So the data protection solutions may not allow you to tie in with the CI/CD pipeline or the, the, the current uh, data uh, center workflow. So this might negatively impact the Kubernetes infrastructure. So which means that it's not fully integrated into a larger data protection framework. So if it's not fully integrated, then there might be a point product or point solutions that you need to purchase or use separately uh, uh, which is different from your production environment's data protection strategy. So this will lead to an insufficient or ineffective solutions for you to manage uh, holistically. Now, second one will be on application complexity. So what one of the things that really differentiates Kubernetes from anything else will be on uh, how you need to uh, manage your, your data protection vendors uh, uh, across a protecting uh, application or protecting a virtual machines. And these are typically, I would say, legacy kind of uh, infrastructure that vendors are doing right now. So when, when we say we protect a NAS array or storage level, uh, most of times it's more of one-to-one -one relationship uh, between the backup and the clients uh, or with the VMs. But um, with Kubernetes, it needs to be more uh, application-centric. When you say applications, typically it will be namespace-centric. So how do we evolve around protecting the application or namespace, which is a very different architecture from how uh, a traditional applications or traditional uh, um, workloads comes in. For example, like uh, Oracle, SAP, all these are very, I would say, physical or traditional infrastructure where we, app, we protect uh, uh, using, uh, using APIs and stuff or using agents to be able to send the data across. So um, with Kubernetes or containers, it's a very different architecture altogether. Now, with, on the last part, there, there's also a gap between the on-premise as well as in the cloud. So when we are talking to one customer who is doing some data protections of their, infrastructure, of their environments themselves, they share on how they miss protecting um, and recovering some of the resources for their applications. 
they couldn't get it to, to recover because uh, the, the, there's a difference between the on-premise uh, uh, data centers as well as those workloads they are running in the clouds. So typically running in the clouds are uh, nowadays evolving into Kubernetes or containerized applications. So there's also there's a difference between how they can back up, how they can recover uh, uh, between on-premise as well as in the cloud. So which is very fragmented kind of design if, if organizations are thinking of extending their on-premise into the cloud environments. Now, so now <clears throat> talking about those since we are talking about all those problems, how NetBackup for Kubernetes is able to help organizations. So we are able to provide a native tools that is able to integrate seamlessly into uh, Kubernetes infrastructure or environments. And, and we, are, um, we can provide a platform and storage agnostic kind of environments. So we are able to protect any of those, um, I would say standard Kubernetes infrastructures of a certain uh, versions of certain builds using CSI drivers for the storage. And uh, it doesn't tie in any of those distributions um, um, when you talk about Kubernetes. So we, we also do application centrics, that means namespace specifically. So we back up all the entire metadata as well as the persistent volume, as well as the PVCs, uh, uh, metadata information and resources. So it's very namespace or application-centric protections. And we provide different flexibilities of recovery, recovery of a granular recovery, for example, a certain metadata or only a certain persistent volume or the entire cluster set. We can, uh, um, we can do the recovery. So offering uh, flexibilities on, uh, on recovery. And this ties in with the standard net backup, um, I would say management policies. So if you're familiar with NetBackup, so we are using the standard, standard way of protecting, for example, using protection plans or policies, yeah, if those who are using the older versions of NetBackup, so those protection plans will be able to have an intelligent way of detecting those infrastructures within Kubernetes and having a, a, a lifecycle policy of managing those uh, backups uh, of, from, from Kubernetes. Now let's go slightly into more details. Now, so <clears throat> what is the, how do we, um, uh, what is the design of this Kubernetes uh, or NetBackup for Kubernetes? So in this diagram, we, we can see that there is a, I would say a general simplified version of a Kubernetes cluster. So we have uh, normally a, a control plane where it has the controller or the, uh, uh, those uh, Kubernetes infrastructure like API servers, uh, on the, <coughs> those uh, 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 four components within the, uh, the uh, Kubernetes that needs to manage the entire cluster. Then with the applications, so namely the main namespaces. So we have namespace once with all the respective containers <coughs> um, as well as the resources and tying with the uh, PVs or the storage if they are using some kind of storage persistent volumes or persistent storage per se. Now, all this infrastructure in, in place. Now, on, if you want to protect it, okay, by using NetBackup, we are using a standard NetBackup infrastructure. For example, you have the primary servers, you have the media servers, which can be on uh, VYO, it can be on appliances, and the storage target can be uh, on-premise or in the cloud environment. Now, <clears throat> what differentiates here is that we, <clears throat> We can implement a net backup namespace by providing some kind of um, containers uh, uh, infrastructure called call, call KOps or Kubernetes operators <clears throat> and deploy as a namespace within the net backup, oh, sorry, uh, Kubernetes cluster. So we have this KOps as well as a data mover pods or containers that will send the data uh, that is captured within the snapshots of the Kubernetes uh, uh, um, metadata as well as the, the, the PVs and send it across to the net backup infrastructure that's outside of the Kubernetes cluster. So this entire flow will be seamless because net backup will talk to the API servers within the Kubernetes and then instruct the entire uh, uh, the, the namespace, uh, capturing all the information, the metadata information of the namespace 
as well as the resources. And uh, more importantly, if there is persistent volume, we will do a snapshot of the persistent volume and send the data across uh, and instruct the PV snapshots to send it across to the data mover ports and, uh, and then send from the port, send it to NetBackup uh, to be managed within, within NetBackup of the, of the typical lifecycle policies within NetBackup. So this is the entire flow. So we are integrating natively within, uh, within uh, Kubernetes and we are leveraging on the existing net backup infrastructure, which can back up the, I would say the traditional workloads. Traditional workloads, what I meant was, is the typical workloads like exchange servers, the SQLs, the uh, Oracles. So all this will be, will be part of net backups infrastructure. Now we are extending that uh, to Kubernetes by offering um, a, a net backup namespace within Kubernetes native infrastructure to back up those data within Kubernetes and send it to NetBackup to be managed. Now, <clears throat> so just now I talked about data movement. So we can use the auto scaling capabilities of Kubernetes. So we have just now I mentioned about data mover pods. So the, uh, <clears throat> using the pods, we are able to send the data across. So after doing a snapshots using native CSI driver, we can move the copy of the snapshots off to any of those uh, uh, net, net backup managed storage by leveraging on the data mover pods. And we can auto scale these pods as, as the, the, the demand or the loads of the snapshots increase. We can increase the number of uh, data movers uh, within the infrastructure or Kubernetes infrastructure so that they can send the data across uh, based on the performance. So we, all these are dynamically provisioned and removed as needed. And uh, is, it also supports the duplications. So the normal standard net backup deduplications were applies. So the duplications will occur end to end uh, uh, from all the way from the, from the data mover, we dedupe and send it across to net backup appliance and store in the same dedupe, uh, the dedupe manner. And we provide uh, encryption at in flight as well as at rest. So the data, sent across will be secure. Now, just now I talk about platform and storage agnostics. So as long as the Kubernetes distribution that you're using or native distribution is of version 1.21 to 1.23, we will support it because we support the uh, uh, cloud native compute foundation. So any of those distributions that are listed here, of course, this is a small subset but any of these major distributions, we will support it as long as the Kubernetes uh, uh, version is uh, 1.21 to 1.23. And for the storage, if, you're, if, if the containers are, are using uh, persistent volumes, as long as the, con the, the Kubernetes con uh, is, the namespace is using uh, CSIs, <clears throat> we, can, we can leverage on the CSI uh, based on the CSI, uh, I would say functionalities that is block based as well as snapshot um, capabilities, we can provide a, a support for that. So the key requirements here is that the Kubernetes infrastructure or environments need to be of 1.21 to 1.23, and it needs to use the CSI interface that is able to support a raw block as well as snapshot capabilities. Then we will support any of these uh, major distributions uh, uh, in your infrastructures, be it on-premise or in the private cloud uh, and public cloud infrastructures. Now, <clears throat> just now I mentioned also on the application centrics where everything within Kubernetes are uh, namespace based. So namespace are typically confined um, uh, uh, applications where each namespace might be a uh, um, uh, single applications or single service. And we back up the entire namespace, capturing all the data as well as the metadata that makes up the namespace uh, um, and recover, uh, protect and recover as single namespace or single applications. So uh, we can also confine or we can also define what is in, what can be included or what can be excluded from the resource within the uh, uh, policy or backup policies or protection plan policies. So we protect, we can protect everything within the namespace. 
we can support any of the net backup storage targets, uh, including the deduplications as well. Now, some of you might be wondering, so some of the applications or some of the name space are database or has persistent volumes uh, or real-time applications that, that, that needs a more consistent way of doing the backup for these workloads or applications. So we can also integrate with, uh, with the uh, pre and post hooks. Uh, <clears throat> so we can run uh, application consistent uh, backups of any database by, uh, in, uh, by inputting some of the hooks like some of the uh, quiescing uh, commands within the annotations so that we can do a more granular, I'll say consistent way of doing a snapshots of the database uh, of the persistent volume and be able to recover the database in, uh, for, with more reliabilities. This is leveraging on the native pre and post uh, processing hooks. Now, <clears throat> because it's um, uh, leveraging on net backup, those who are familiar with NetBackup knows that there's a standard way of doing all these protection plans. So all Hey, just checking. Did we lose Jackson? Or is it is it my end? No, it looks like Jackson is frozen at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, that's fine. That's fine. I think um, until he comes back, what I'm going to do is I did see um, Sassy Pong um, has mentioned one question that he would like to answer uh, live. So Sassy Pong, maybe did you want to take that question and I'll see if Jackson comes back. All Sassy Pong. right. Yeah. Yeah, all yep. right. Uh, uh, I think we have uh, one interested uh, question uh, in the, in the Q&A box. The first one I would like to bring up uh, to, to, uh, to all of us is, uh, they asked about can a third party or customer EDR2 be integrated to the anomaly detection? Uh, as we mentioned, uh, as Chexan already mentioned about the anomaly detection solution that bundled into the net backup. Uh, for now, anomaly detection can send the alert to the CM platform. Uh, so this way it can help the, the, the security team get notification or uh, what the wrong uh, situation on the backup environment or on the production environment as well. So this one is the uh, first uh, I that that is a uh, uh, important uh, question from the customer. I met a lot of customer ask on this one as well. So for now, we are able with the indicate with the same platform. Yeah. Good. Good. Thanks. Uh, looks like Chexan is back. Chexan, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry, there I don't you know go. why. <laughs> now yeah. we we lost you, uh, completely. In in fact, now that now that we are on the top of the hour, uh, maybe Chexan, did you want to just uh, conclude uh, with with your uh, slides. Yeah. Okay. I, I I will not share any slides since it's a more conclusion. <laughs> so uh, at the end of it, what what uh, how Veritas is able to help is to offer a, a very um, systematic plans of protecting against ransomware by of course uh, different various products from Veritas, including NetBackup including data insights to give you visibilities and reporting using IT analytics. So give you a complete visibilities of what your infrastructure consists of, including the dark areas or dark data that organizations may not know. And of course, NetBackup, being NetBackup, it is able to protect and store the data into an immutable or indelible storage, uh, whether it's on-premise as well as in the cloud. And in talking about in the cloud, uh, one key areas or one key driver is on Kubernetes. So now NetBackup is able to protect Kubernetes natively by having or uh, providing a native Kubernetes names or namespace of NetBackup so that we can auto scale according to the demands and requirements of, of uh, Kubernetes um, data. So as long as there's a lot of data, then we can auto scale up the data mover ports so that we can, uh, I'll say, uh, increase the performance 
and scale down when the performance requirements, uh, load requirements reduce. So all these are natively integrated uh, within, within NetBackup. And uh, of course, uh, we offer different kinds of granular recovery. So give you give organization the flexibilities of recovering individual metadata or entire mean space or even the entire cluster. So we don't have to recover the cluster onto the original data, uh, original Kubernetes distribution, but also to another distribution. So you can think of it like a, a, a migration. So some customers are thinking of how do I move my entire Kubernetes infrastructure from a of an on-prem to a cloud environment or from a cloud environment into an on-prem environment. So NetBackup now offers you an options of doing a migration or recovery from different locations uh, and it doesn't tie in with the Kubernetes distribution. So it gives you a flexibilities. So cloud native or uh, uh, native Kubernetes protections and it ties in with the ransomware protection as well because that backup is able to provide that kind of uh, alerting mechanism and malware scanning. So that's in summary. <laughs> so Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Chek San. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm sure uh, you know we had a little bit of content still remaining for our uh, session, but uh, make sure make sure that you are uh, if you have any questions, team, uh, please put in uh, send in your questions to the uh, email address that we've just posted in the chat. We will make sure that we'll come back to you with an answer. And uh, now that we are at the top of the hour, thank you all for joining in and making time today. We will see you in another three or four weeks time for the next session. I hope you found uh, this information useful and reach out to us if you have any further questions. So thank you, Chek San, Sassi Pong and Ronnie and Trudy and Julie for uh, hosting and helping us through this. Uh, until next time, stay safe and thank you again. Bye-bye.